I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Capella University is rethinking higher education. With its game-changing FlexPath learning format, you can earn your degree on your schedule and fit your education seamlessly into your life. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Today on the James Altucher Show. I think many of us want, I mean, that word Spartan means so much. I think many of us want to be Spartans. We don't want to be overburdened with a bunch of material things. And who doesn't want to look like a Spartan? Who doesn't want to feel like a Spartan? They just weren't a bunch of assholes. Their thinking was like, If we want to be free from tyranny, if we want to be free from kings or queens or whatever it may be, if we want to be free of disease, we're going to have to work hard. And they called the body and mind, they called this thing the structure. And they said, we got to take care of the structure. We got to surround ourselves with like-minded people. We got to have a system in place that we adhere to, right? And the Spartan way is like, I didn't invent the 10 principles. These are just age old principles that if you embrace them and you get to know them and you perfect them, you're just gonna crush life. Well, when do you know when to give up something? Let's say you've been practicing the piano for five years and you're saying grit is, you know, go that one more time, find, you know, find what you've been missing, try to improve. What if you say, look, you know what? I'm not good at the piano, but maybe I'll be good at something else. Like when do you know, when do you still keep your grit, but you know to switch to something else? I have a great answer for that, and it took me a lifetime to figure it out. Thanks for being here. This is my podcast. Welcome to the James Altucher Show, hosted (laughs) by Jay. (laughs) Jay, you can just do my show now. (laughs) How you doing, Joe? What's up? What is that? Asteroids in the back? Uh, It's Defender, Joust, Robotron, Stargate. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Defender actually more popular than Pac-Man and Asteroids, believe did, it or not, in the nineteen eighties. Did not know that. I don't it's the know. It's most if popular quarter game ever. I played a lot of Donkey Kong. Yeah, Donkey Kong. Wait, we're the we're like the same age, right? You we we like paralleled in every way. C- Queens at the same time. Cornell started a business in college and then um owning a farm in Vermont. That's right. We which are, I didn't we, do. <laughs> Well, well, you can. You, I have a farm here if you want to buy it. Quickest way to quickest way to become a millionaire in Vermont is to start with ten million and then buy a farm. <laughs> why? Why are you selling your farm? It looks beautiful. I'm looking at a photo of it right now. No, it is beautiful. I, I wouldn't give it up for the world unless there was a virus and it required me to find a bunch of money so I could eat. But other than that, <laughs> I would. Other than that, no, I would never get rid of it. Is it the idea that you're supposed to grow food on your farm? I know, but it was a little cold. It's been snowing a lot. Uh, yeah, that's true. That's the problem with Vermont is there's snow. There's snow. Uh, we do have some greenhouses, but you know, farming is a lot of work. I mean, um, for not a lot of return. 
you know, as long as there's grocery stores, I think it's hard to convince people to do the, the hard work of farming. At least I found that here over the last 20 years. Well, so what do you think of the idea that maybe it's good to outsource farming and manufacturing, like essentially all these shit jobs to overseas while, you know, we work on innovation and inventing and, you know, uh, you know, all the things that make America great, which is pushing the frontier. And right now the frontier is in technology and, and so on. It used to be in farming and manufacturing. Now it's in technology. No, I, I think it's fine, right? I, I, I love the idea of local farming as a concept. Um, and I think it's healthier for sure. It's better for the environment. But my experience at attempting it here for 20 years uh, makes it almost impossible um, to be effective. However, there are a few pockets where um, some folks have made it work. Even in Vermont, believe it or not, there's a, there's a place called Pete's Greens up north, even, even further north of where I am. And he just absolutely kills it. Uh, but he's, he's figured out the system. So outside of tiny little pockets that won't feed a ton of people, even Pete, who's done really well, it's a multi-million dollar um, greenhouse and farming operation, which is big in farming. Um, even that's not going to feed very many people. So I don't think we have a choice but to outsource. I, I, however, if you have a, a, a something that kind of stops the, the earth from spinning, like a virus or a war or whatever, um, it's handy. It's handy to have food nearby being grown. Yeah. Now, do you have a local grocery store? How far are you from a city? Uh, the major city here, uh, don't quote me, is about 50,000 people in a little city called Rutland, Vermont, and that is 25 minutes away. So there's there's the Chipotle, there's a Dick Sporting Goods, there's all the things you might need, a couple of pizza places, gas stations. Um, outside of that, in this little tiny town where I am, there's a little general store and a gas station and a post office. And uh, there's only 400 people here. And actually, we own the general store. So, um, is that a profitable business? <laughs> no, that is not a profitable business. That should be outsourced out overseas as well. You know, here's the thing. Like I, so I own a local bar slash comedy club. Yeah. Owning a local anything is really not a good idea <laughs> if you want to make money. No, if, if the goal is to make money, which in business it typically is, I would say, um, no, L little local businesses, I think are sexy, right? My phone is ringing in the background. Hang on, Alberto. Can you turn that off? Sorry. No one checks my schedule. They just call nonstop during the virus. Who's calling? Uh, who's, who's calling you? Who was that, uh, Alberto? Oh, it was our CFO, probably telling us we're out of money. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> CFO of, of which business? Of Spartan. Okay. Yeah. We don't want that to be out of money. No, 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 no. No, we'll be fine. Uh, the biggest challenge for Spartan is... Um, when the lights come back on, let's say two months, three months, 10 months, whatever you believe, when the lights come back on, we're in 45 countries. We have 325 events to turn back on. That's like a giant sprocket, rusty sprocket with sand in the gears. Trying to turn that thing requires so much money. But the good news is Hearst, Hearst is a, a minority investor in us. And Hearst uh, called us a couple of days ago and said, hey, just want you guys to rest and sleep easy. Um, we are 100% behind you, whatever, whatever you need. So well, that's I great. Think, I, I yeah. actually, uh, I, I know a lot of the guys up in the management at Hearst, particularly on the Hearst magazine side. And I think they're, they're a good solid company that wants to do, you know, good, good business with entrepreneurs and media. I, I think they're a good partner. They're a really good partner. I I've been, I've been shocked. I mean, you and I come from Queens, the way they've acted throughout our entire relationship is not what you and I would be used to coming from Queens. Um, they are so awesome. Um, you know, they'll push back and they'll um, really question any ideas I have, because obviously they're on the board of directors. Uh, but at the end of the day, they say to me, hey, listen, uh, our philosophy at Hearst is uh, ultimately we'll align with the CEO. If the CEO wants to do it, we're gonna align with, but they'll test me and they'll push back and, 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 and they'll force me to make sure this is something I wanna fight over, but they typically let you win the fight. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Um, I, I ran into a guy who was the CEO of Hearst Magazines. I Frank? Ran from, oh, no, no. Frank you know, was the CEO I, of the whole company. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, I, I remember uh, I ran into him right before this lockdown. I was in California a few weeks before, and we were staying at the same hotel, and I hadn't seen him in a couple of years. 
because they they had wanted me to maybe write for some of the Hearst magazines, and I really wanted to write for Cosmopolitan. That was like my dream. I think Cosmopolitan was it. I forget which one is the the top female magazine for Hearst, but uh, uh, I always had good meetings with them, and it was always 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 good love. Maybe it was um, Troy Young. Do you know Troy Young? I, I don't know Troy, but but um, you know they own Popeye. They own the, the cartoon character Popeye. You're kidding. I yeah. thought. Um, God, and those, the, the early Popeyes were such classic look, like beautiful animations. I hate computer generated animations. I like those, those early Popeye, early Superman, early uh, Disney. Yeah. Uh, it was so beautiful. Sorry. I, uh, I, I agree. Uh, is that, is that, Joe, is there any yeah. uh, radio in the background that's running? Or I would kind of hear like people talking or something. Uh, hey guys, quiet on the set. You guys can wrestle, but just do it quietly. We have wrestling going on in the background. Here you want to, you guys want to see? Is this audio only your 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 podcast? Yeah, it's audio only, but I'm right, sure you, James wants to I'll see. see it. I'll see the wrestling. Let's go. Let's see it. All right. So, come on over here. Um, Whoa, this, do you get cold in there in the winter? No, this is all heated. This is all heated. I love this. this. Yeah, this is um. These are two. These are the Batello brothers. Be matter of fact, you could help out the Batello brothers. They're new to the whole social media thing. Okay, and, tell me. And what's the name of your Instagram, guys? Brothers. But very simply, Batello Brothers. Uh, so at Batello Brothers on Instagram, they're, they're two really aggressive uh, wrestlers that have a family of five uh, brothers. They, they come from Massachusetts and they, um, they've all been top of their game in wrestling. And um, their, their father takes no um, prisoners. And so I'm friendly with the father. And so those two boys and their third brother, it, um, is on lockdown with us here on the farm. Well, uh, how do you spell the name? Batella? B-O-T-E-L-L-O, uh, -L -L Batello Brothers. All right, let's see, I'm looking it up. It's a tiny Nick little and, Instagram. Nick and Mark and Nick Chewy. and Mark, yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you could help them out, it'd be great. We're doing it. Batello Brothers, let's see. I'm gonna, uh, they got videos. It looks like they're doing some good weightlifting here. Yeah. They should teach like a course or something, Batello Batel Fitness. Hey, they want you to teach a course on fitness. He said, okay. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Done. Changing lives. Changing lives. Doing good. So, so, and Joe, you, you've been all about changing lives. You referred for a little, uh, a few minutes ago to, to Sparta and you have these great books. Uh, the last one is the Spartan way you have Spartan up, uh, uh, you know, the Spartan way, eat better, train better, think better, be better. Let's talk about Sparta for a second, how you get into it. It's very close to kind of the stoic philosophy. And, and I really admire how Ryan Holiday, for instance, has taken the, the old stoic philosophy and really modernized it. And it feels like you've been doing that uh, side by side with the Spartan philosophy. And in the Spartan way, you list the Spartan core virtues. And I want to talk about those. And particularly, I feel the, 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 country, the culture, the economy is going to start moving toward even closer towards those core vir virtues after this lockdown and quarantine and shutdown. And I'd love to talk to you about it. But how'd you start getting into this? You're, you're hardcore. I haven't actually joined you guys on your 5.30 a.m. call. I've been meaning to, and then I've been finishing a book and staying up late. But we, um, just so you know, we've been talking about you every morning, wondering when is he going to be on the call? I know. Well, tomorrow then. Make an appointment. Tomorrow it is. 5.30 a.m. We want you on the call. I, you know, I can't be carrying the weight of the call from Queens on my shoulders alone. So I need another Queens guy. I know. Queens got to represent. They got to represent. So, so listen, if you think about where I grew up, right, in Howard Beach, um, it was organized crime capital of the world. If anybody out there saw the movie Goodfellas, um, it was literally across the street from the family that that movie is based on. When there's a scene in the movie and they talk about Peter and Paul and Peter and Paul, they were the, they're right across the street from me. And so it was, it was crazy times, crazy times of- um, Like what's the worst thing you saw growing up? And maybe they hid you from it, I don't know. I was outside a house. It would take me a little while to explain. Let me back up and then I'll answer the question so it'll make more sense to the listeners. How's that? Yeah. So, so um, when, as a young kid, you know, five, six, seven, eight years old, you don't really know 
anything. You don't know what's going on. You, you notice that some people have Cadillacs, some people wear nice clothes. There seems to be a lot more respect around certain people. They have rolls of hundred dollar bills in their pocket. Like there's something about those people and you're attracted to it. You want to be that person. And as you grow a little older, nine years old, 10 years old, 11 years old, you start to learn more the whispering, the kids, right? They're saying things they shouldn't say. You want to be one of those guys. Um, and so how do you become one of those guys? The, the tape I started playing in my head was, am I tough enough, right? I literally started taking cold showers at, at a young age. I started carrying, not kidding. Did you, did, you know, did you know that's what the Spartans did with their kids? Like the kids always took cold baths or you know whatever the equivalent of showers were back then? Yeah, we'll go through the agogi, uh, which was the, the system of training young children in Sparta. But honestly, I, I didn't have an introduction to Sparta. I just, I'm a young kid. I see these tough guys. I want to be tough. I'm going to take cold showers. I'm going to carry, I literally carry duffel bags of rocks around the block. I would walk around the block. And I remember my neighbor saying to my dad, Hey, everything okay with your son? I seems to be carrying bags of rocks around the block at night. But that I had these things I was doing to kind of toughen myself up. And, um, my mom finds a completely different, um, direction in life. She, she walks into a health food store. And she starts to get into yoga and meditation, becomes vegan. It was the antithesis of everything we're talking about. So but, she and was, it's also was an odd lifestyle choice back then in the, let's say, late 70s, early 80s, whenever it was. It was early 70s. And it was, it was um, probably the only health food store on the East Coast. Right? <laughs> there was no Whole Foods. There was no yoga journal. None of this. She just happened to bump into an old Indian guru who just landed in Queens at JFK. And she just happened to meet this guy at a health food store and they started talking. Anyway, she obviously was old enough to recognize that, you know, going to jail and killing people and stealing for a living was not good for her children. So she starts pushing back um, and she's trying to fill my sister and I with these crazy bohemian crunchy ideas, which I want no part of. I want to be a tough guy. I want to, I want to, Cadillac, I want rolls of hundreds in my pocket. And um, ultimately my, my parents get divorced and my mom moves my sister and I to Ithaca. And I start going back and forth at a young age to see my dad, go back with my mom in Ithaca, go back to my dad. My neighbor, my father's neighbor, after my mom left, um, is the head of the Banano Organized Crime Family. And he sees that my family's going through turmoil. And he says, hey, um, Joe, why don't you clean my pool? on Saturday, show, you know, show up at uh, eight o'clock in the morning, clean the pool. So I'm going to make $35. It's a lot of money back yeah. then. I'm not even a teen yet. So I go, ne I go next door and I start to become friends with Joe and his family. And, and uh, I was already friendly because it was my neighbor, but I, I really started to become friends. And he starts teaching me some life lessons. He says, um, Oh, can I ask Joe? And I don't mean to interrupt, but yeah. what, what were your, were your parents cool with you? Like, Hank, you know, clean the pool of this, guy who was a known, you know, organized crime figure? Well, so my mom at this point was in Ithaca, so she was kind of disconnected. And my dad, I'll answer it this way. My dad was in trucking and air freight and, and businesses that it would be very hard to be in those businesses if you weren't already part of that ecosystem somehow. Right, right. right. So there was not an issue going next door. Now, my dad, did push and, and try to teach me that, look, these guys spend an enormous amount of energy, Joe, an enormous amount of time doing things that are illegal. If you put that same time and energy into things that are legal, you make more money and you could actually spend the money. In other words, he, he was trying to teach me at a young age, look, I know you're fascinated with it, Joe, just like I was, but there's so many better ways to go. So And, so and your, your dad kind of summarized the, the theme of the whole TV series, Breaking Bad. Like this guy is so smart, but he do what he puts so much time into, you know, cooking methamphetamines and you know, I won't give away the plot, but obviously it, it's it, it, the, the slide is downwards rather than upwards. That's right. So, so, um, so I start cleaning the pool and I'm attracted to it. And he says to me, um, look, three life lessons that we should take away right now on this podcast for, for anybody that wants to be in business. I'm going to write them down. All right. Number one, he says on time is late. 
He says, if you're gonna be here at 8 a.m., you better be here at 7.45. Love it. Okay? Stuck with me my whole life. Number two, you gotta go above and beyond. What do you mean? He says, if you're cleaning the pool and that's what I'm paying you for, this is the first, my first job I'm at, my first, the first day on the job. I'm, if you're gonna clean the pool, you better straighten up the lawn furniture. You better clean out the shed. You better go way above what I'm paying you for so you make yourself indispensable. Like I, I come home and I see, oh my God, the kid was here today, right? And number three, never have your hand out for money. You bring value to the relationship first and you'll get paid, but don't worry about asking for it. You know, I, I think those rules are so valuable and it's funny how, I don't want to say today's generation doesn't get it because it's always up to the parents and people always say the same thing about every generation. But I felt like somehow I had to learn those things as well. You learn those things often the hard way. And often you're, the second rule is really interesting that you got to go above and beyond. I always tell people, if you're, if you have a client, let's say you start a business that provides some service and you have a new client, I always say over promise and over deliver. And people actually try to correct me and they say, oh, don't you mean under promise and, and over deliver? And I'm like, no, because when you under promise, you're lying <laughs> and you're just trying to scam them into thinking you, you did more than what you promised you would do. And that's really good. If you over promise, you'll get the deal. And then if you over deliver on top of over promising, you have a client for life. <laughs> And, and this is such an important concept rather than just kind of cutting corners and scamming your way into a deal. And anyway, I, I full heartedly, uh, uh, agree with all of those things and then never hand your, have your hand out for money. That's so important too. Like a lot of people listening to this and a lot of young people and even older people are always trying to figure out what's my passion. What am I interested in? And what am I, um, really, you know, willing to put my full heart into, if you think about that in terms of how quickly can I monetize it? you're never going to find your passion. You're just going to have a sucky life. I like, by the way, that was a word you and I would have grew up around sucky. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So, so I learned these three lessons with Joe and, um, before you know it, he introduces me to a friend of his because I'm doing a good job and I'm, I'm checking all the boxes. Right. And you could imagine that his friends were not low level guys. Right. So then my next customer literally, is the, the head of the Lucchese crime family, huh. right? And then you could imagine my next customer is the head of the Gambinos, right? And so before you know it, by the time I graduate college, and that's a whole other story I wanna get into with you, I have 700 customers, Wow. okay? Wow. Because I'm following these three simple principles. And, um, and then the other advantage I have, a huge advantage in that these guys trusted me in the backyard. And so trust was a big thing. You couldn't just have anybody in your backyard, right? If you were doing this for a living. Right. So now, now how did, how did you have 700? Were you able to uh, get cheap labor who also you could trust? So, uh, right away I, I went to the neighborhood kids and I started uh, hiring neighborhood kids and they would last one day, two days, maybe a week on a stretch. And it was a disaster because they didn't want to work, right? They didn't come from uh, a place where uh, hard work, like anybody that worked hard in our neighborhood, they were second generation, third generation, like brick laying or a pizza place or something like that. And they already had a family job. So, so the picking the, the people I got to pick were like at home, <laughs> they weren't already working. Right. And, and, and they were kids or cousins that saw other guys with money that weren't really working for a living either. And so they didn't want to work. So I had a real tough time finding labor. Then somehow I stumble upon two cousins, two kids from Poland. Now, if you can imagine two kids from Poland in the, in the eighties, late eighties, um, they grew up, they grew up in the cold war, right? They grew up in, in communist Poland and they get a job with me and they're a little older than me. They outwork me. I could not break these guys. Like we're going seven days a week. No problem. We're going to 11 o'clock at night. No problem. We're skipping lunch. No problem. These guys were fighting for milk. And I quickly learned, it was like awesome for me to learn that at such a young age, like, oh my God, I can't compete with an immigrant. 
like an immigrant, right? So, so I gotta, I gotta work. That was my fourth lesson, right? I gotta work. I gotta live like an immigrant. It's not, I'm not, I'm not being a derogatory. I'm not saying anything negative, about. I'm actually, I'm actually saying something positive. Like we get fat and lazy in America. An immigrant wants it. And so, and so that's going to be my ethos. I'm always going to live and, and attack life like, like, like an immigrant would, like somebody that wants it would. Right. So I got these Polish and we're killing it. And, um, and I'm not planning on going to college. My grades aren't that good. My SAT scores aren't good. I'm graduating Ithaca high school and I want to get back to the neighborhood. I want to run my business. I want to be around those guys. I got visions of eventually who knows where my path is going to lead, but I want rolls, a hundred dollar bills in my pot, right? I want to, I want to get there. This business is a stepping stone in my mind to, to doing big things. And, uh, a friend of mine in Ithaca at high school, three months before graduation says, Hey, why don't we go to Cornell? Because Cornell is located in Ithaca, New York. And I said, how the fuck are we going to go to Cornell? Like my grades aren't that good. We haven't even applied everybody. Like, how would we do that? And he says, oh, my dad's a professor. He'll get us in. So coming from Queens, you could appreciate this, right? That would make sense. Like, oh, we got a guy that's going to get us into Cornell. So we do the interviews, both of us. I get a suit. I go through this interview. I tell my dad, hey, I'm, I'm going to, uh, I got an interview at Cornell, which is a big deal. Just having the interview is a big deal. I'm still light years away from getting into this thing. Interviews go great for he and I, uh, but we both get denied admission. Grades aren't good enough. Everything we suspected. His dad can't pull those strings. So my decision is made. I'm going back to the neighborhood. I'm going to run my business. My business is growing. I've paid. I, I, I got plenty of money. Like every, everything is working in, in my favor. I don't see why I'd go to college. My friend comes back to me and says, listen, my dad told me we shouldn't give up on this idea. I said, what do you mean? He says, Cornell and most schools allow you to go extramural, which means you could take up to three classes, nine credits, and the other kids that are accepted could take five classes, 15 credits, so we'll be short, and our credits won't count, except if we do well, we could reapply and prove that we could handle the workload. So we, we're gonna be a little short, we kick ass, and they'll have to accept us, and then we'll just make up the, the, the shortfall of credits later. So I said, okay. I guess what I'll do then is during the summer while I'm in Queens running my business, I'll go to St. John's. I'll take a few courses at St. John's. I'll learn how to study because I don't want to go cold to Cornell in the fall. I haven't really ever buckled down on studying. And, uh, and then I'll get those two classes out of the way so that if, once they accept us, uh, I'll, I'll be just like everybody else. My friend turns to me and says, that's ridiculous. I said, what do you mean? He says, um, if we're gonna buckle down in the fall, why don't we go party all summer? I'm gonna go to Vegas and literally just party all summer and then buckle down in the fall. So right there was that, was that divergence, right? Where that, that taking the cookie, that um, not delaying gratification. My buddy went in that direction. I went to Queens, I ran my business. I did two classes at St. John's. I fell in love with school. It was the first time I ever took school serious. That fall, we both meet up again in Ithaca we both buckle down. We take our three classes each. I get two A's and a B, which for me, you know, I might as well have landed on the moon to be in an Ivy League school that I was not accepted to. I knocked out two A's and a B. I did St. John during the summer while running my own business. I'm paying for school myself from the money I made. Like, I'm on top of the world. I'm the big man on campus in my mind. We both apply in January after that semester is completed. We both get denied. Not, you're not in. Why, why'd you get denied then? Like you're like at that point, you probably had Cornell professors writing your recommendations. We had everything going our way. Um, and, and the woman who had originally interviewed us said, listen, I am not going to create a backdoor system for people getting into the school. Like you're not going to skirt the system. If you want, you, know, it, you can go to another it, it, school. So, sorry, Joe. It's, I, 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 I want to interrupt. It's so interesting. She says that because. I sort of feel like the backdoor system is actually the admirable way to get accepted to things. Everybody in the tri-state area with decent grades applies to Cornell, and then it's like a lottery who gets in. And yet, if you can go in through a creative way, by the way, I also went in through a back, via a backdoor to Cornell, and I would not have gotten in on my grades or my, you know, I, I was practically 
almost thrown out of high school. My grades were so bad and I never showed up for school and I was getting in trouble for cutting school all the time. And not that I'm a, a, a bad kid. I just hated school. And uh, I had to get in through other means to Cornell and it wasn't connections. It wasn't, you know, a legacy or anything like that. I had to do something similar, which was to stand out and do something different. When you, when you go to the room least crowded, that's where you find success. And it's funny that the institution was penalizing you for that. Yeah, she, she penalized us. And, um, my friend made a, a decision at that point, my buddy, John, he said, you know what? Screw this. I'm going to go to UNLV. I had a fun time in Vegas, uh, during the summer and he went to UNLV and, uh, and I said, you know what? Um, nobody's going to beat me, right? I'm from Queens and I'm going to do it again. And I'm going to keep coming here until she finally accepts me. So I did another semester. Uh, this time I did it alone. My buddy, like I said, went to UNLV and, um, I did well again and I reapplied and she denied me. Oh so then God. I did a third, I did a third semester. I did well, I reapplied. She denied me by the fourth semester. I was broken. She, she, she had won. And I told my mom, I said, listen, I'm moving out of Ithaca. I'm going back to New York. I don't need to finish school. Um, I'll just go to Queens, run my business. I'm fine. And she says to me, now I'm four semesters in at this point. I'm halfway through my fourth semester. I'm quitting. And she says, do me a favor. Uh, meet this woman I teach yoga to. You got to remember, there were not yoga studios back then. Like now every corner has a yoga studio. She was teaching yoga in the living room. Right. She was pushing vegan diet. This was not cool stuff. And my mom's friends were a little crunchy and bohemian, a little weird. And so I would not have expected my mom to have any connections to help me in any way. Right. I didn't want any part of that silliness. She says, meet this woman, Anita Racine. She's uh, I teach her yoga in the living room. Um, she's awesome. And she works at Cornell. I don't know what she does. So I have lunch with Anita and um, Anita says, hey, Joe, I was looking at your records. Your, your grades are pretty good. Um, do you have any interest in textiles? The reality is I didn't really know what a textile was, right? I never really discussed that term. And, um, and she says, because I run a textile department in human ecology and there's 92 women in the department studying and there's no men and we want some diversity. We want to bring some men. And I said, you know what, Anita, I love textiles because, <laughs> <laughs> because, because textiles are women. I love women. So, so, um, so she ultimately accepted me and uh, brought me into this department. And there were two men, ultimately, me and my a very close friend out of China now, um, who, whose family had the contract for Victoria's Secrets and Spider Ski Wear out of Hong Kong. And they sent him to study textiles, which makes sense, at Cornell. And he and I became good buddies. We were the only two guys in the department. And, um, and I studied textiles. And so I know all about women's hemlines now. I know any, I could design a dress with you. And I ended up graduating. I ended up graduating on time. Um, and I did, and I did really well. And it was, it was, it was a game changer for me. My buddy, my buddy who made the left turn and went to UNLV, who I secretly under my breath laughed about for years saying, I made the right decision. I went and built my business. I ultimately ended up on wall street. I can't believe he quit. He has a giant medical marijuana business now. So ultimately maybe he made the right decision. I don't know. That could be, I mean, I, my guess is marijuana is going to be legalized after this lockdown's over and, and could the whole industry could explode more than it has even. Exactly. These days we're all investors trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like, I can pick my team 
or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But People in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're, they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180 plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. But again, I do think the backdoor approach is a great approach because on top of getting into a place like Cornell and graduating on time, you also get this life experience of 
figuring out, you know, this alternative route that, that so millions of kids go through the front door, three kids go through the back door and you learn something completely new that the other millions of kids don't learn every time you use a back door to get to the same place. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and you know, a buddy of mine, uh, talks about the third door, right? Which is what you and I are talking about. And so I think so many people quit, uh, when the front door is locked and, and, uh, you and I would know from the neighborhoods we come from, you go around the back, you go in through the window, <laughs> there's other ways in, right? Right. And, and it's a shame to, um, and so I ultimately I got in and it changed my life. I could have easily quit. I had four good reasons to quit. But going back to the neighborhood and some ugly stuff I might have seen. So I get back to the neighborhood. I graduated. I'm running my business. And um, one of the bosses says to me, hey, I need you to go um, talk to my partner. His name's Gas Pipe. All right. That was his nickname, <laughs> Gas Pipe. And just wait outside the house. It's in Mel Basin, Brooklyn. Just wait outside the house. Don't ring the bell. He'll come outside when it's time for you to come in. He, he wants to put a pool in on the roof. He's got a flat roof, wants to put a pool in on the roof. So I wait outside the house for like 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour, two hours, three hours. Never comes out. Turns out he was inside killing the architect. Oh my gosh. True story. And, um, and he killed the architect because the architect was complaining and asking for money. So that goes back to that lesson, Rule lesson number, number three. three that I originally learned. Don't ask for money. Don't have it. Yeah, don't don't have your hand out. You know, I saw a guy get stabbed in the back with a fork. Um, I saw some crazy shit. Um, and how do you, how do you know? About, but but how uh, do you know? How do you know he was killing the architect? Like, did he get caught? Did it? What happened? Yeah, it came it, it came out later. It came out later when when Giuliani uh, ultimately busted uh, most of organized crime in the early nineties. Uh, a lot of those stories um, came out and. Uh, Man, I had one story. I had one guy say to me, hey, I need you to go to uh, five towns, you know, five towns in uh, Long Island. And um, my girlfriend has a swimming pool there. Her father died. Take care of it. Don't ask her for any money. I'll give you money later, the guy says to me. No problem. So um, I'm cleaning her pool. I'm taking care of her stuff for her. She's probably a few years older than me, let's say at that point. I'm 20, she's 25. The guy that sent me there was probably 30 and um, she's got no dad, dad died. Um, it comes out later, this is a crazy story, it comes out right later that the guy that sent me, that he, he was dating her, okay? His father had killed her father, but nobody, oh but, they, but they didn't know it, that came out later. So, um, so yeah, yeah, some crazy stuff. I went off track. I apologize. No, no. I, I asked the question, but we got like five, five great lessons out of it and, and heard a great story. <laughs> Wait, did that relationship continue once they found out no. that the guy's father killed her no. father? No. They broke up right then or? Broke up right then. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's a story. That's I can say, by, by the way, I continued to do work for her. And when I would show up, her new boyfriend was in a wheelchair because a couple of guys tried to kill him, ran him over and under the blanket on, I'm not kidding, on his lap were two Uzis because he had been, he'd been run over, right? They tried to kill him and he was not going to find himself in that position again. And so whenever I went to that house in the wheelchair, two Uzis under the blanket, that was, yeah. Did he ever anyway. walk again? Do you know if he ever walked again? Never walked again. No, no, Ugh, never horrible. walked again. I don't think he made it. Um, I don't think he made it past another three or four years, but, uh, just complications from everything. Uh, no, probably another attempt <laughs> that was successful. Oh, okay. Yeah. The, the Uzi's, the Uzi's <laughs> didn't protect him. No. Yeah. Okay. So he, that won't, that's not a good, uh, strategy. No. Uh, so, so, okay. So you, you went to Cornell, majored in textiles. You had this, this really funky background between Ithaca and, and Queens. Uh, by the way, Ithaca was pretty, granola even back then, right? I mean, you had the Moosewood restaurant, which became the famous Moosewood cookbook. It's like one of the first vegetarian cookbooks. Uh, that was a good restaurant down back in, I think it was like the first vegetarian restaurant I ever ate at actually. And, I, was there, uh, I was there recently, believe it or not. I love Moosewood. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great, it's a great restaurant. And, uh, so what happens next? How'd you let's bridge into Sparta. You're the Spartan way. 
which is the title yeah, of your last so, book, and Sparta's yeah. your company. Yeah, so during, during this entire um, journey, I'm sticking with this idea of cold showers. Am I tough enough? I'm working my ass off with my business. And um, I meet a guy at Cornell, a guy named Al Capucci, Italian guy. And I click with him right away because I was around a lot of Italians and I knew how to speak to them, especially older folks. And I brought him a couple of bottles of Sambuca as a gift. He was very successful. He was a Cornell grad. Uh, he was managing money for a big fund out of Utica, New York. And um, he was a judge. I had, t I had um, taken an entrepreneurship class and, and they had a challenge. You had to come up with a business and Who was your professor? Your business and give me the name of the, the entrepreneur hey, professor. Hey, David Ben Daniel? David Ben Daniel was a professor, yes. So I, yeah. took, um, I took the class with Ben Daniel. Al Capucci was one of the um, uh, judges during that. And, uh, and I won. I won the, um, the award, the, the entrepreneurship uh, challenge, the $5,000 challenge. Reuniti, Reuniti Wines was given out the, uh, the $5,000. The, the founders, I guess, had gone to Cornell, the two brothers. So, um, so anyway, Al says to me, what are you doing when you graduate? I was graduating in a few months. And I said, well, I got a, I got a business in New York. I'm gonna go run it. He says, you're an idiot. He says, you gotta go to Wall Street. With your work ethic, uh, with your you know, hustling, you, you, you gotta go. And I didn't really know much about Wall Street. Um, being in Queens, it was, it's a long stretch to get into Manhattan. It wasn't easy to just snap your fingers and be in Manhattan. And, um, and so I listened to him, but I didn't do anything with it. I went back to the neighborhood. I, I started buying backhoes and bobcats and excavators and trucks. And I, I, you know, I was still enamored with that life and that, and think about who my friends were. Like, it just felt like that's where I should be. Well, this guy, Al called me every month, the first of the month, every month. You, you're going to go to wall street. Yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll go look for a job. You know, nice talking to you every month, next month, next month, next month for probably four or five years. Okay. So 60 phone calls. This kid that he hardly knew, right? About five years in, he says to me, um, look, if you're not going to listen to me and you're going to waste your time in the neighborhood, at least buy a stock. I'm going to give you a stock tip. And I hadn't really bought any stocks. I wasn't savvy in that area. I had some money. I, my, my business was making money. And he says, I want you to buy this stock, Syntex. It's a drug company. Whatever. I hang up the phone that day. I go and see one of my clients who owes me money, who's a pharmacist, um, last name Novak, owns a pharmacy. I don't know why I'm, I'm remembering the name, Eli Novak. And he says, um, he comes out, he owes me a bunch of money, like over 200 grand, because I had done a wow. ton of work to his house. And um, he, I said, Eli, my friend told me I should buy this stock, this, this drug company, Syntex. And Eli says, I can't, I can't believe you're asking me about um, Syntex. He goes, I just was in the shower thinking I'm going to buy some today. And he brings me in the house and he sits me down. He says, listen, he says, you're young, you're single, you're making money. This is a great time to start investing. If you, if you blow up, you, you still have the earning capabilities. You could bounce back. And he gets me on the phone with his broker and he convinces me to buy 14, I'm sorry, 10,000 shares of Syntex at $14 a share. So 140 grand. He convinces me to, cause he owed me 200 grand. So I, $140,000 I plunked down on this stock, first investment. The next day, the company gets taken over. I made a hundred grand, it was up 10 bucks. Oh my gosh. And I was like, I am going to Wall Street. I called my buddy Al, I said, Al, <laughs> you were right, I was wrong. I turned to the two Polish cousins who, who were working for me all these years. I said, guys, I'm giving you the business. You could pay me out over time, I'm out of here. And, uh, and they took over the company. They still run it today. They, they crush it. They have made millions and millions and millions of dollars with it. Still exists. And, um, and I went to Wall Street. When I got on Wall Street, I uh, quickly uh, figured it out, started my own company. Again, you and I are from Queens, so we can't help ourselves, right? And, um, and I started a trading firm. And I started uh, my customers with the banks and I used the principles that I learned from the guys in the neighborhood. And I built a really big, successful business in, 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 you know, from mid nineties through early two thousands. And then nine 11, nine 11 hit. And, uh, that was tough because our office was, you know, a hundred yards away. 
And then um, I started to just feel fat and just out of shape. We were making a lot of money, but um, I just didn't feel good. I wasn't all the things I was chasing in Manhattan and all the things I was chasing to be in finance and money and just didn't feel as good as I'd hoped. What was your firm doing? Were you like a broker or? Yeah, I was a broker for the banks. So if Goldman or Merrill or Morgan or if they wanted to buy um, equities or derivatives, I service them. And so a lot of people would say, well, why would the bank use you? Why wouldn't they just do it themselves? And the reason was, and I find this in my own business, I'm sure you found this, when you tell one department in your company that they have to use another department, it somehow creates a riff and there's always friction and it's a nightmare. They wanna use whoever is gonna service them the best. For example, if you had a manufacturing facility somewhere and there was a, a sales team that did the design work and the selling, and they had to use your factory and your factory was a little late with the product and they didn't make it the way they wanted. But instead, if they could go out to another factory, that other factory is gonna service them better, gonna bend over backwards for them, probably charge them better pricing because that guy or girl that owns that other factory is living or dying by her customers. Right. Whereas right. the one that you're paying payroll to, they don't care, right? right. They, Maybe they service them, maybe they don't. If it's a little late, no big deal. They purposely put friction in, in because it, you get it. So we found a niche for ourselves where we were this outside, small, nimble trading firm that was, was faster, was smarter, was more efficient, was cheaper than them using their own in-house people. And um, it turned out to be a big business, so, but I wasn't feeling it. So I stumble upon my mother's stuff again. You know, I, I, I actually, I went and had lunch with her at Moosewoods and uh, she was still in Ithaca and I started doing yoga and I started doing races, running races, half marathons, marathons, adventure races, you name it. And I felt fucking great. I felt alive again, the way I used to feel when I was mixing cement or driving a backhoe or carrying rocks around or taking a cold shower. And so I just fell in love with it. And, um, and being an entrepreneur and not being able to help myself, I started putting on races and they were a complete flop. You know, I was putting on these crazy races all over the world. Well, uh, like what's an example of a, a race that you would put on? What's a crazy race? So the first crazy race I put on was uh, 2001, right after 9-11 called Expedition BVI. It was the first race I put on and it was 350 miles long. And it included swimming and kayaking and biking and hiking and coastaleering and sailing. It went for about seven days. And um, during that event, I lost the guy, vanished. And we thought he was dead. And we got the Coast Guard involved. Wow. And they, um, they found him 150 miles away. He had drifted and ended up on Little Tobago in a little dinghy, a little boat, and he survived. <laughs> Wow, it's like a Robinson Crusoe story. Robinson Crusoe story. Uh, Sports Illustrated did a story on it, The Real Survivor, because at that time, the movie Survivor was out. And um, and so that was the first race. And I lost you know half a million dollars putting that on. And then I put on another one and another one. And I just couldn't make it work for about 10 years. But I was, I was still making money on Wall Street so I could afford the losses, even though it was irresponsible and stupid. Um, in that time, I met my wife. We bought this farm up in Vermont. We started having children. And then in 2010, after the financial crisis, I, um, I said, you know what? I'll take one more stab at this race business thing. I'll change the format. It'll be shorter distances. It'll be either three miles, eight miles, 13 miles. Sprint, super, or beast, I call them. The name of this company, the name of this race series will be Spartan. And, um, and we'll see what happens. I'm only going to invest 50 grand doesn't work. I'm out. I've already lost so much money over the previous 10 years. I'm not going to do races anymore. And then 50 grand turned to hundred grand turned to 200 grand. You know, I was completely undisciplined. I invested an insane amount of money because I felt like this was going to work. More and more people started showing up. First, it was a uh, 500 people, then a thousand then 1500, then 2000. First, we were in one country, then two countries then five countries, then 45 countries. And here it is, um, 10 years after renaming it Spartan, 45 countries, uh, 2 million participants a year, 2 million registrations a year. Um, and I am now fending off a global virus pandemic shutdown. Now we'll, we'll, we'll get to the, the pandemic. It's from what you, you basically are the, the sandwich meat between two crises. You know, you have the financial crisis and now, now 
What do you think happened? What do you think it was about the character of the 2009 crisis that made people that made people respond more to your races? Like the, the idea of this Spartan style race. Was there, do you think after 2009, people took a step back from consumerism a little bit? They wanted to kind of know that they can handle a little bit of a, a, a scarier lifestyle, a rougher lifestyle. I think it was, I think it was a few things. I think, I think uh, I like to say to people, and, and in, in, let's call it, I've got six more minutes, so I'll, I'll be as exciting as I can for six minutes. How's that? Um, yeah. I think um, if, if you and I didn't grow up in Queens and we grew up in, you know, Delhi, India, like really, really, really rugged place, minimal food or Poland or, or Poland when it was, you know, communist. Um, I would argue that Maybe we don't want to get people off the couch. Maybe people need a little bit of a softer life. Maybe they should have a couch and Netflix and stuff. But, but we, that's not the case in the U.S. That's not the case in the first world. In the first world, it's gone too far in the wrong direction. We're too soft. As a matter of fact, if you look at the country as a whole, it has an immunity problem, right, to this, to this virus. It's, it's attacking folks that have health issues, many of which are completely avoidable. And the reason many of them have health issues is because we overeat as a society, we undertrain, we, we just don't take care of ourselves. We eat shitty food, like we just don't take care of ourselves. And so in that kind of environment, which is the first world, because the US is exporting all this uh, shitty lifestyle, um, I think we need, just like I felt on Wall Street, like I need to sweat again. I need a purpose. I need an unbelievable community. I just, I didn't even, I couldn't even verbalize it. I just knew I needed it. Um, I think we need it. And I think, I think when I showed people how good it feels, I mean, it's basically yoga and yogis and vegan all wrapped in a Spartan cape and a Spartan helmet. When they came out and they felt the earth and they felt the community and they felt themselves and they met themselves when they're out there, when they're carrying a sandbag up the mountain or crawling under barbed wire, like, holy shit. It feels good. I feel alive. I just did something I never thought I could do. Um, it just took off like wildfire. But, but it, you know, if we went into the, in, into the favela in Brazil, I don't think it would be that exciting for them. Like, I think if we, if we were selling couches in one store and Netflix versus Spartan, I think couches and Netflix would do really well in the favela there, right? Like, like I think they need a little more comfort in tough places. But, but in, in easy places, uh, they just need this. And coming out of the crisis, there are, people were out of money, people were broken, like mentally, financially, and so it just felt good. It's a very inexpensive form of transformation. Look, for how many years on this planet did, did cultures have um, rites of passage? We don't have them anymore. And so this is really a rite of passage. That's what this is. And so what was, I, I, I... I want to talk about the virtues in in your book, The Spartan Way. But what was it about the training of children in so Sparta is this known city state city state from you know Greece back in ancient you know BC times, and uh, they were known for uh, you know good a good example is the movie Three Hundred. But they were basically known for these very uh, austere lifestyles, uh, where where the name of the state became synonymous with you know, essentially living a very tough lifestyle, toughening, toughening you up so that you could defend your, your state and, and be, and it became part of the, the culture to be tough and, and, uh, you know, always be training. Yeah. So, so I did a lot of time. I spent a lot of time, I actually bought some land. Fam we, we bought some land in Sparta. We're very close to the mayor of Sparta. Um, and so I, I really dove in and really studied um, Sparta. And, and it's exactly like you described. I mean, the children went in at seven years old. The, the boy was taken out of the household and brought into something called an agogi, A-G-O-G-E. And that went on for 13 plus years. And that child was trained hard. And that child was hardened and became harder to kill. And their thinking, they, they just weren't a bunch of assholes. Their thinking was like, if we want to be free from tyranny, if we want to be free from, you know, neighbors that are coming after us or, or kings or queens or whatever it may be, if we want to be free of disease, we're going to have to work hard. 
we're going to have to train hard. And, and they called the body and mind, they called this thing the structure. And they said, we got to take care of the structure. We got to surround ourselves with like-minded people. We got to have a system in place that we adhere to, right? We can't get overly obsessed with food or women or drinking or any of this stuff. It's got, we got to minimize those things and we got to focus on this structure. And by the way, don't get so obsessed with legacy because legacy was a, was a very big thing back then, right? Let's just focus on the here and now, do a great fucking job. And if we do a great job, we're automatically gonna have legacy. And so that was their thing in a, in a, in a nutshell. And, um, and I, think, I think many of us want, I mean, that word Spartan means so much. I think many of us wanna be Spartans. We don't wanna be overburdened with a bunch of material things. And who doesn't wanna look like a Spartan? Who doesn't wanna feel like a Spartan? So we got really lucky with the name. We got really lucky with the ethos. And when you look at the book, we've written three books now, and it's really the philosophy on our whole system and, and, and my growing up and, and the things I learned. And the Spartan way is like, I didn't invent the 10 principles. These are, these are just um, age old principles that if you embrace them and you get to know them and you perfect them, you're just gonna crush life. So I'll, I'll run through them quick. Um, and then I gotta, I gotta jump off, I apologize. Um, I, oh, I, could no talk, I could talk to my Queens friends for uh, seven hours here. Um, you gotta start. We'll, we'll do another one because I think I think a lot of these are worthy of a uh, 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 part two. The the Spartan core vir virtues. You know, instead of going through all all the virtues, let me just ask you about one of them because I was, I'm curious your opinion on one of them. And we could do we'll do another podcast about just these these virtues and how okay. you've used them and how you've seen other people people use them. But you have one of the virtues. And by the way, you know you were about to list them. But it's like commitment, passion, discipline. Yeah. But one of the virtues is grit, and you say get gritty break out of your comfort zone, do the hard, scary shit, find your passion and persevere. What does, what does grit mean to you? Yeah, so grit is that ability, even when um, you're stuck in the house for 40, today was day 41. Even when you're stuck in the house for day 41 and there's no end in sight, um, you're unsure, you're, you're lost, you're not making progress, to still wake up, somehow muster up a smile have some semblance of structure in your day and get through it, right? If you're a pianist and you've been playing and you're not getting any better, somehow continue to play. If you're Thomas Edison and you're inventing the light bulb and you're 900 versions into this thing and every one of them explodes and doesn't work, you still show up in the morning and you grind through it. That's grit. And, and grit, you know, you can't just snap your fingers and, and have that skill um, oozing out of you. But the good news is we, we have it as human beings. We've lasted so long on this planet. We have it as babies. Babies will, you know, just keep fighting and surviving until they're dead, but we lose it. We lose it by wrapping ourselves in all these luxuries and sitting on these wonderful couches and painting our nails and watching Netflix and drinking lattes. We start to lose the grittiness, the edges, right? um, uh, that we had. And, and, uh, and so what we do is we bring it back. Well, we when do you back. know when to give up something? Like, let's say you've been practicing the piano for five years and you're saying grit is, you know, go that one more time, find, you know, find what you've been missing, try to improve. What if you say, look, you know what, I'm not good at the piano, but maybe I'll be good at something else. Like, when do you know, when do you still keep your grit, but you know, to switch to something else? Uh, I, I have a great answer for that, but, but, and it took me a lifetime to figure it out, but should we save it for the next episode so that we like, let, let's, this is like let's a save it. Let, let's save it. Sparta part two coming your way, listener. And Joe DeSena, uh, you got to come back. We'll schedule something for the next uh, week or so. And uh, uh, good luck on surviving on, on the farm. Don't, uh, here, don't run out of food here. or anything during this lockdown. I'm fasting actually. I'm fasting to make it harder. I will see you later. Excellent. At FedEx Office, we know that for small businesses, the holidays can be stressful. But we're here with the holiday cheer and expertise you need to help get your to-do list done. Need to create that? Our online design tool has got you covered. Pack and ship these? Just come in store and we'll take it from there. Print those? How does same-day turnaround sound? 
This season, let us help you slay the holidays with the products, services, tools, and timelines that will make your business bright. Create more happy for the holidays at office.fedex.com.